and, and in my artist statement I talk about that the kind of crazy back and forth between what's predictable and controllable and what is not. And that is also, we talk about the randomness of science and genetics and evolution and the random changes that need to happen for new forms to evolve. And that's what I love about clay, is the clay pieces that are built, but I have some control and the DNA is there in the clay and in the process of building, but then when it goes into a salt kiln or it goes into a raku kiln, there's where the randomness comes in. And I love that interplay between those two parts of science, <coughs> yes. And as a chemical scientist, as I can look at and say the DNA of copper that gives it the red colors, that's there in the red rocks, it's there in the red clay, it's there in the red paint. That same substance comes across in all the different ways. And being a science geek, I find that fascinating. <laughs> so um, I like to make the boxes and kind of enshrine things that are about science. I, my friend was here earlier, Gail, and she runs around and, to garage sales and gets old books and because she loves them and then says, here, do something with this. <laughs> so we have, you know, connections to other people that way. So I guess all of the themes that I work with relate to science and math because um, that's what my passions are in life, the things that I'm most interested in and spend a lot of time combing beaches and dumps and woodlands and things to find artifacts that I always kind of say they're ready to be the next thing. It's no longer a shell, it's ready to be something else. It's ready to be a wing or a, a breast or a head or a, the curve of a back and it's ready to go on to the next phase. And we do have a gallery in Elkhart Lake where I make things that are small and pretty and, and popular to sell, but I like to make things that are more about my passions of science, which it was really nice to have Frank and have a, another place to show the sort of things that, that don't fit that genre. So that's my story. <laughs> and so I sort of started doodling. I've always been a big fan of uh, Alexander Calder and those little circus figures. And wire has just always fascinated me because it, uh, it's like drawing in space as opposed to on paper. In fact, it's probably one of my favorite projects that I have in one of my classes at Lakeland is, uh, involves using wire as line and as a, as a drawing. So there's no particular order. I just have a big box of chairs that I've done. And each time it was the idea of we took a few minutes to just celebrate being together. And I guess the design of the chair just happened to be the mood I was in for the day. So they're tall, they're twisted, and they're short, and they're tangled. Some look figurative to me, and some just look like chairs. And um, there's one little table in the middle. But they're, uh, they're displayed, it's called measured pause, um, because I didn't want to use some kind of celebration word that just seemed so contrived. Um, but I wanted to display them, and I thought of putting them on these little yardsticks which would be representative of some type of measure. And the yardsticks are, there's four of them, uh, two in the center, because they were too narrow to support the chairs if I just use one line. But three of them are from actually a furniture store that was near my house where I grew up in Milwaukee. And one is from a hardware store in Chamoy, which is where we are now. Uh, so I, I thought about it and put a price on it of $300, and I thought, well, why would anybody buy that? So I suggest you just start your own. <laughs> <laughs> I brought a couple of bottles of champagne, so I mean, I'm more than happy to give you a bottle of fashion. Uh, the piece underneath is uh, a piece I did at, uh, at Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina. It was the first time I'd spent any uh, time away from Karen, and she has a very extensive dance background. And in thinking of her, I was again 
and I'm doing my Calder-esque impression of doing this group of dancers in a circle and the little dance floor was made by taking a piece of plywood and cutting it in all the strips and then gluing it back together so it would look like a dance floor. Um, so she's my favorite dancer if you were wondering who that was alluding to in there. <laughs> with people because it had a it had a history that was kind of magic but it was anonymous and then I think it was maybe two years ago we were at St. Vincent's and I said look at those billiard balls <laughs> you know I found this box of billiard balls that had been donated and if you look at them closely they're they're just so worn out and so scarred and so dirty and all of a sudden it was the same, I had the same visceral reaction to that set of billiard balls and I went, this is like thousands of games by people I don't know or won't ever know. And it's like, wow, that's, that's all this like history, but it's not my history, but it's like those grips were on those hand trucks. And so I thought, well, I, I just keep thinking about these things and so I, I wanted to preserve them, so then the idea of jars came up, and of course, ball jars. I couldn't go with the Kerr brand because that wouldn't make any sense. And um, <laughs> had to find a place to display them, and I wanted them up like you'd find them in a, in a cellar. And uh, happened to find this box, which was a nice billiard cloth green at a resale shop, so that sort of fit the bill. But then I thought about the numbers 1 through 15, and what did they mean? So Karen had a book of numerology and symbolism looking through, oh yeah, that's cool, that two has got a history of meaning this, this, and this. And so I let that sort of lay there for a while. And then I went, now, what do those numbers mean to me? And so there are labels on nine of the 15. And I'm not in any hurry, but those are numbers that I've attached uh, significance to for me personally. And, I, and you can look and you can ask me about what the, what the different ones mean. Sometimes they're a date, sometimes they're not. Um, I'll just talk briefly about the number one here. And uh, it has a name on it. And the date is March 25th, 1893, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, uh, my grandparents, of which I only knew one of four, uh, we lived with my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, Margaret, and her husband, my grandfather, Leo, who had passed away shortly after I was born. It was maybe four or five years ago. I was visiting my mother, who's still alive in Milwaukee. She'll be 91. And... Uh, we were talking about her, her dad, and she said, you know, your, your grandfather's name wasn't really Leo. What, really? <laughs> so, well, what was it? And she said, well, it was Julian. I went, oh, how cool is that? <laughs> and apparently, Leo was, Julian wasn't cool at the time, <laughs> so he changed it to Leo. So I thought, you know, that came, came to be a great story. Well, then, what happened with number one, and the reason um, this one got the label was my grandmother, Margaret, was the most influential person in my life as a child in terms of doing things with my hands, interest in gardening, and just 
to this day, she's had the greatest impact. And so I thought, I know, I know Grandma was born in 1893. So I'll call Mom up and ask her when Margaret was born. So I call up and I say, hey, Mom, I said, when was Margaret born? She goes, oh, I know it was, it was March 25th, but I don't remember which year. And I said, I know it was 1893. I said, and then she said, Oh, well, her name really wasn't Margaret. <laughs> okay. Jesus. It was Magdalena. It's like, great. So I went from 60 years of thinking Margaret and Leo, but it was really Julian and Magdalena. I thought, a lot more romance than that. So, uh, and that's how we have Magdalena Liebeck on the top of this label. So, uh, like I say, I'm not in any hurry to fill in all the numbers when it comes to me. So, thank you. I like your job. I like your job. I like your job. I like your job. I like your job.